Good morning, everyone. Thanks for showing up. Um, so today's lecture is going to be on military engineering. I'm also going to try to tie some uh, aspects of da Vinci's artwork in at the end as well. Um, as a follow-up from lecture four, we discussed some non-destructive evaluation techniques, in particular digital image correlation, which can allow dynamic stress-strain measurements um, at, at live speeds. So the case study we talked about was for blunt force trauma to Kevlar helmets from ballistics. Um, we talked about order of magnitude that the DIC was capturing was about 5,000 frames per second. So that's when we say dynamic stress strain measurements, that's about the speed we're talking about. We discussed tribology, wear, and additional metallurgical considerations with respect to friction. Um, and we also discussed da Vinci's experiments on wooden blocks with respect to static coefficients of friction as well as kinetic coefficients of friction. Um, and then we did a case study on running rail for commuter and freight um, surfaces. Before we get started on today's lecture, I just wanted to follow up with everyone. Um, you should have either received an email from me through Stellar um, or uh, followed up uh, separately with respect to your half page proposals. So if you haven't gotten anything from me yet and you submitted it, then you can consider it approved. They've all been reviewed. Um, if you have follow-up questions on the paper, you can feel free to email me or Professor Eager on that. So before we get started on the Da Vinci's aspects of military engineering, I wanted to follow up with something we discussed a few weeks ago with respect to design of experiments for either undergrads who are going to do a senior thesis or for grad students. It's important to understand not only the number of variables in your experiments when you're doing graduate work, but also it's important to understand what's known as the sensitivity analysis of these variables. So when you have very complicated research projects and you're trying to mimic real world scenarios with either aerospace uh, or other real life situations, you have to, you're not going to be able to do a full factorial design of experiments because the number of experiments uh, after you get about three variables, uh, it starts getting out of hand for experiments you can perform. So you should do what's known as a sensitivity analysis. That will tell you which variables in the question you're trying to solve are going to be most sensitive to changes in the experiments. And that will actually allow you to cut out entire swaths of samples and for mixed mode effects and limit the total number of samples you need to perform. Uh, a good guidebook with respect to this for non-destructive evaluation is the DOD handbook, uh, Mill Handbook 1823. Uh, it should be on Stellar, it's a, and if not, it's a free download off of the government website. But within there, it talks about some free programs you can use. Um, if, you're, if your research deals with statistics, one is called R. Um, that's a statistical program, and it also allows you to design and build your own probability of detection curves based on uh, flaw uh, detection or, or flaw miss, as well as target flaw size. So this is actually can be used not only for metallurgical samples, it can be used for biological testing. You just have to transfer the technology to your different uh, experimental research. But it is very useful for real world applications. So uh, if you're not doing computer simulations and you have to actually design an experiment, uh, small scale, the, first of all, they take a lot longer to build. And then if the experiments don't go as planned, it will end up having to take more and more material, raw materials to do this experiments. So this is a way that you can cut back on experiments while still addressing the most sensitive problems for your research. Mixed mode would be, say we're talking a nuclear plant, it would be temperature pressure or it would be radiation temperature. It's effects of two variables on mechanical properties. So one of the issues in nuclear plants after 40 or so years of service is 
potential embrittlement of the steel um, that's, that's encased in the concrete for the containment. So then you could do less experiments because they're, first of all, they're very difficult to put dose on metal samples. You have to put them in breeder reactors for six months to a year to attain the, the level of rads you need. So that would be a way to limit your mixed mode, of, mixed mode variables. Um, this is, here is all, um, what's known as a receiver operator characteristic curve. So basically, it's your probability of false positives goes from zero to one, and your po probability of true detection of a flaw goes from zero to one. And then uh, it, uh, it's a Pareto optimal curve, so as you go 0 0.5, you're, you're around here. One of the things to note with this is um, it was developed during World War II to assess capabilities of radio receivers, which we're going to look at some of those in later slides. A couple limitations of that, these curves is that it cannot um, consider a frequency of defectives. So an example for that would be um, your sprinkler systems. If, if you had a million sprinklers sold of a certain type of sprinklers, and out of that million, 100 failed. But within a single building, you had 20 or 25 failures. That, this ROC curve would not be considering those subpopulations. What you could actually use to address that type of statistical question is known as a Fisher's exact test. It's similar to uh, chi-squared chi if, if you're looking at uh, statistical regression. But for that type of subset within a larger set, the, the appropriate test would be known as a Fisher's exact test. Um, the other thing is that your ROC curve cannot consider the influence of the target size. So for aerospace industry, the minimal flaw size that they expect to initiate and propagate a crack is the key variable. So this curve doesn't take into account that that's flaw size. If you lower that flaw size, then you will then increase your probability of detection. Uh, but one of the key things to know about doing experiments and setting up probability of detection curves is you have to put flaws into the sample that you do not expect to detect. If you only put flaws in that you expect to detect, you will not get an appropriate curve. So in order to get an appropriate curve, you have to actually put flaw size in less than what you think the threshold of detection is. Um, so this is just some things that are useful for people who have research that relates to statistics. For today, we're going to discuss first part um, with respect to da Vinci's cannons and catapults. So a kind of a refresher on your either high school or, or undergrad physics classes. But for a projectile motion, it's an object that moves through both space and time under the influence of gravity. If we're within Earth, if we're talking about space, that's a, that's a whole different uh, lecture for a different time. Um, the, the motion is defined by both horizontal vertical coordinates. And one thing that is generally uh, taken for granted, but in in real world uh, situations, you, you don't neglect air resistance as a downward force. But if we look at these equations here, in the simplest form, there's, there's four equations in the x and y directions to define your forces uh, for projectile motion. So if you shot a cannon and it left the cannon at a certain angle, you have um, a velocity in the x direction and you have a velocity in the y direction. So you basically just break it down into its x and y components, either co cosine of theta or sine of theta. Um, and within these force equations, uh, you're assuming that your acceleration is gravity and it's in the negative direction for the y direction. Uh, for the x direction, you're assuming that the acceleration is zero. So if this was actually on wheels and moving, then this would slightly change. But for the simplest scenario, you're assuming a stationary cannon or some other type of ballistics. Um, these are the four equations that define based on how long 
it's going to be in the air and as well as the distance that you expect the projectile to travel. So da Vinci did quite a bit of work as a war engineer in the late 1400s, early 1500s um, with respect to cannons and catapults. So they, they were, Italy was in a period where there was a lot of warring factions and they were also at war with France. Um, it was, part of it was known as the Hundred Years War and then part of it was fighting in between areas of Italy itself. So da Vinci got hired as a war engineer to develop these types of projectiles in his spare time, you know, he did Mona Lisa and other things like that. They didn't have internet back then, so he, he had to keep himself busy somehow. But um, with respect to his sketches, one of the things to note is we talked about the materials available to him at the time. So it would mostly have been wood. There would have been limited amount of iron, but this is before Bessemer process. So it would have had to have been a small batch scale process where you have uh, someone in a foundry actually uh, forging pieces for the springs or whatever. Um, we also talked about the materials for the, the spring loading action itself. So in some cases, it was silk or a, a strong material or some other type of fiber. So like uh, if you ever seen um, a tire hanging off a tree trunk and you, and you have, have some fibrous material. So that for the most part, that's what they were working with back in the time. Um, and you'll see here, these are the basic components that we're talking about. So you have your spring, spring release. This would be a modern design where there's actual metallic springs and this is all metallic. In Da Vinci's time, it was actually mostly swaged or interlocked wooden connections, and he worked with gears to have things move relative to one another. Um, the, well, I'll show you in some images later on, the projectiles that were actually being used were steel. They, they, they were shooting steel balls, basically. Um, but other aspects of the design for catapults, you have some type of restraining rope until you're ready to release it. Um, and then you have your payload, your arm, and your, your cantilever. So if we're talking at the very basics as if it's bending moments and things like that with respect to catapults, uh, whether you're in School of Engineering or not, one of the, one of the most useful books for, for stress and strain is this Rourke Stress and Strain. This would take into account different material considerations. So um, as uh, Dr. Baskin talked about in some of the previous lectures, if you had a hollow cylinder versus if you had something that was uh, monolithic but solid, this will tell you the different bending stresses and the different formulas you need to use for moments of inertia and those types of considerations. But at its simplest, um, you know, these are, the, these are the components involved with a catapult. So the mock-up of da Vinci's design is right here. As we were talking about, there's either going to be rope or some type of silk, woven, woven silk or woven type of fabric material that is keeping the tension and the catapult. Um, he experimented with different construction materials. To, to test this elasticity. So it was basically, rather than looking at it as they sometimes do in mechanics as a spring dash pot model, he was just testing different ma construction materials to see the spring back visually. So it, wasn't, it was less of an experimental process and more of a trial and error process with the materials of the time. I wanted to point out some of his other sketches. So they take into account projectile motion as well as angular motion. So um, these involve the aerial screws. We, we showed these in the first class. Uh, uh, some of them, in particular, this aerial screw design uh, was based off a design that Archimedes had previously uh, originated. And he took Archimedes' original design and then he modified it based on, for 
for his particular need at the time, it was for hydraulics. So for pushing water through a device. Um, as well as you see here, there's other, in addition to his, him having sketches and other things in with his lab notes, uh, this is the movement. It could be a movement of um, a pedal wheel, something with gears on it. But you're also seeing other things with respect to shooting arrows, which would also be a different type of projectile question. So he dealt with the issues of projectiles as well as gears in a lot of these designs. Um, with respect to the angular motion, if you're talking about something that's moving in a circular fashion, so uh, the example would either be discs or blades in an airplane engine, but it could also be wind turbines that are rotating. You have to take into account this arc length region you have a, a angle theta that you're at, as well as some distance r that your component is in length. So the tangential speed for that would be the differential of the arc length with respect to time. And then you can define that more as an angular velocity if you're talking turbo machinery. So this is at the most basic. This is assuming we're not taking into account all the friction and things where we talked about in the last lecture. This would just be assuming things are rotating in an inertial type atmosphere. So I wanted to show some images from a site in Rome that I got walked through while I was there to bring about both the materials of construction around the time as well as to see one of the catapults they had at the site. So we talked about stone and uh, the you know, materials of the time, a lot of stone, a lot of gravel. Uh, what you're seeing here is there's also quite a bit of refractories once you get up to the, the elevated areas. So the refractories and the grout provided a little extra reinforcements from incoming projectiles. Um, these things are also sloped down, um, and that was, you know, if you had to shoot something out, you wanted it sloped down in the design. Uh, at this time, terracotta was also a, a building material being used quite a bit in this part of Italy. So if you, if, if you see some of these designs, it's important to understand the materials of construction for the time. Now taking a look at the catapult they had at the site here, one of the things to point out is you can actually see the steel balls lined up in the background here. So in some instances, they use just iron balls, sending them that way. Depending on what the application was, sometimes there was also wood used as material for projectiles. So it depended on if they were shooting this thing into a moat or shooting it for some mar maritime application. Um, the very simple, basically the same as the diagram in the previous slide shows. Um, it's basically you would just have cut that restraining load and, and it goes. So a couple other devices with respect to motion um, and that were used at the time for military purposes. This device here would be hand cranked, and what you're seeing here is essentially a forging hammer. So this is if we're talking about a mechanical advantage or a way that da Vinci thought about designing something that a hum you could get more uh, force out of it than an individual human could by just lifting it. His concept was to have it basically set up on a, a crankshaft and to hammer back down forth like this. But as you see here, a lot of it, as we talked about last week, it's as simple, it's just simple geometry. So da Vinci looked at it not uh, really from anything other than the, the sizes and the geometries and the trigonometry of these devices. So that is essentially the easiest way of looking at a gear. If this, was, if this is thought of as the gear and the component, it's related to the geometries of, and the distances here. So this is a sketch that da Vinci did of a cannon. This is actually from a later period of time. This, this was a cannon um, from 
England uh, 1800s time. What you're seeing here is the size of it is actually not very large. If you looked at the catapult in the previous slide versus this cannon, the catapult actually has more area and length. But what you're seeing here is this was when they actually started to use iron in the, in the cannon designs. One of the ad additional things to point out with respect to cannons is the thought of using steam uh, as a way to force the projectile out. So that actually uh, was things that da Vinci thought about in the 1450s to 1500s. It, as I said, here's his steam cannon drawings. So there's, this is the, basically the thoughts going through his head as he's designing this on how can I use the steam to actually be a force. And this tied in with how da Vinci saw the world. He looked at things as terms of wind and water. So this is how can he use the wind to give himself an additional mechanical advantage to send his projectiles further than the opponent could send back at him. Um, at its simplest, it is a, a, a wooden uh, cart on wheels, but this would have been the, what they would have made of iron at the time. So whether it would have been pig iron or something made from a foundry, this, this wouldn't have been made from uh, a factory type process. This would have been made from, from a, a apprenticeship forging house. To tie it in with the history and what was going on at the time, so we're talking, say, 1500 as the year. Uh, and 165 years later is when Isaac Newton started thinking about his theories of gravity. So this is before those theorems were put into a place. Um, and one of the uh, interesting pieces of information about Isaac Newton was he was 22 years old when he did a lot of his work on gravity as well as other theorems in the Princi Principia Mathematica. In the span of about 18 months while he worked on uh, his mother's farm and was basically secluded is when he did a lot of his groundbreaking theorems. Um, but to put it into perspective, Da Vinci is doing these things 150, 175 years earlier. So I wanted to tie some of Da Vinci's um, flying machines into some more modern techniques. Uh, this, the, the slides we're gonna see he, here are actually from uh, a trip to Berlin. And this is actually what, it's, they have a um, international spying museum there. So there's some really interesting stuff and I wanted to tie it into both the flying machines with respect to in World War I and II, they actually used carrier pigeons and they put miniature cameras on the carrier pigeons to fly on the front lines. So it was, these cameras were actually timed to, to the, obviously the pigeons didn't, you know, push the button. So they were actually designed these back in 1910 to 1920 to basically take pictures at a preset time at, and the, the pigeon knew which altitudes to fly at so they could get information on the opponent without having to put any soldiers who are, weren't already on the front line in harm's way. Um, but uh, this will tie also into, uh, not to bring up uh, all, all these movies or anything, but Da Vinci was one of the earlier cryptologists. So we're gonna see some devices related to cryptology and signals. So if you've seen the um, Angels and Demons movie or read the book, one of the things that Da Vinci did uh, in his time and some, of, some other of the inventors also did was they had these basically devices, code, uh, codex, cryptex, whatever they call them, but one of, the, one of the designs they built in with the materials of the time were they, if somebody put the wrong code into the cryptex, it would release an acid and it would dissolve whatever notes were on the paper that was hidden in there. So this will tie into some of the 
World War I, World War II intelligence techniques we're going to look at. Before that, I did want to show um, some images. So this is um, based out of London. There's some interesting uh, images here, but the Royal Air Force, la either last year or two years ago, they had a 100-year anniversary. So they basically brought out uh, planes that they used from World War I through to more current planes and allowed civilians to go walk on different planes and helicopters and things like that. So I want to call your attention to the, the, you can look through this whole book, but the pages that are tagged have information on some of the planes we're going to see. One of the interesting things to note about these World War I planes is this is wood and ad adhesive and in, your, in your turboprop. All right, so you do have an engine here, but the materials of construction in World War I, it still was not to the point where they were flying steel fuselage materials. That didn't, that didn't come till probably 20 years later or so. So one of the things to note is actually this is wooden materials, these bi-level planes. It was mostly wood and adhesive that kept these things together. So for that uh, plane, that's uh, the BEC-2. It was uh, around 1914 to 1918 is when it saw a majority of its use. So if, if the body is made out of wood and the engine uh, is made out of the little steel that they could produce, how do you make sure that it doesn't actually catch fire and uh, burns? Uh, uh, for they, they had quite a few issues while these things were in air. So um, they, there was a, a finite lifetime on how long that these planes were expected to, to last. Plus, they were in dogfights, so there was an expectation of casualty at the time. Um, there was issues with vibration, and that actually um, there is a, a classic case study on failure analysis on a similar plane with the wooden design, what happened was the adhesives, because of the vibrations over time, it, it, you lost that intimate connection between your glue and the wood, and it, it led to planes basically breaking apart in midair. Um, so the, this particular plane was a two-seat reconnaissance plane, but it was also used for um, bombing, artillery, and other types of missions. Um, in terms of lengths, 30 feet length, uh, 36 feet span and a 27 foot length, it's not a very large compo uh, structural component. So that's another way that they accounted for the engines. And if, if you were thinking about the engines, you shouldn't think about your automotive engines that you have now. Maybe think about a, a lawnmower type engine. That would be more applicable analogy to what type of horsepower these things were putting out. Um, top speed was uh, 72 miles an hour, and the maximum altitude for this particular plane was 10,000 feet. Some of the other uh, interesting, uh, this is a Chinook. So this is the same as we have in American military, Chinook planes. Um, one of the things that I want to call your attention to on this is this has the, your rotors that are in sync with each other. So one of the issues with these helicopters is if there's any off, uh, if it gets hit with a projectile or if there's some issue with it while it's on its mission flight, if these, are not, if these don't remain in sync, then this, plane, this helicopter won't stay up. It's critical that your tail rotor and your front rotor are stay in sync for this particular helicopter. This is used for heavy lift support. Um, it can carry up to 55 troops, and it can also hold up to 10 tons of mixed cargo. So if they can use these not just for war, but if there's areas where people are starving, they use, the, they use these to drop food in for for the people. Um, these have been used since about 1980. There have been 
some upgrades since then. Um, they, they did change the design when they did the V22 Osprey. That was the, that was the uh, aer aerospace vessel where the wings actually move w while it lifts up. They were, and there was quite a few losses in the design process for the Osprey. But for the Chinook, it's actually been looked on as one of the more robust helicopters in the fleet. Uh, it has a 60-foot rotor diameter and 51-foot length. Um, two pilots, two crewmen, uh, maximum speed of 184 miles an hour, and this has a maximum altitude of 15,000 feet. So one of the things I want to call your attention to is actually the design of these, these blades here. If you see, they actually are tapered down at near their connection point to the rotor here. This is different than other helicopters. This is one of the design features that it, the Chinook was unique in, in these features. The other thing to note is the, the surface area that these blades take up. All right, um, if I may include some images for um, turbine blades in next week's slide, but these are quite large blades um, it, for non-turbine generating purposes. When we're talking about turbine blades, they're actually order of magnitude size of a football field when you see them laid down on the ground. So you have to take into account, like we talked about, size scales. Um, and so we're talking about 60-foot blades here. The other uh, thing to point out is when you see some people in the back here. So for 55 people, this is, um, it's a tight fit. But as you see, they will also be able to use it as a roll-on, roll-off vessel for not only food, but other munitions that are going to go to ground. Um, just some other images with respect to the military engineering side. Um, in London, they have Churchill War Rooms, uh, and you can actually go in and do a tour of it. It's, it's pretty interesting to see in a very tight space. So th at this point in time, London was being bombed by the German, German Flugtag, um, and they basically had to have this under steel bunkers. So if you go over there and do a tour, you'll actually see girders uh, above the area. And one of the things to point out that it was, for Churchill and, and his associates, it was their global hub of information where all their strategy was taking place uh, on where they were going to send troops and how they were going to defend the, their country. Um, essentially, it was a secret bomb shelter. Um, it was fairly surprising that it didn't get bombed during the bombing. Um, one, just in terms of scale numbers here, uh, 60,595 60, civilians were killed in Britain during the bombing in, in World War uh, II. So to tie in with what we discussed earlier with da Vinci and his ways in his notebooks that he basically put his own forms of intellectual property in, either putting in equations in the wrong locations or he had tricks to, for himself. Um, so modern day, we're going to see some issues related to signals, intelligence, <coughs> and recon. <coughs> so... <coughs> Oftentimes, <clears throat> sensitive information is encrypted. And <clears throat> in current times, you have both um, signals intelligence as well as foreign instrumentation, <clears throat> which is typically pertinent to non-human communication. <clears throat> so one of the things that we're looking at in this image is from about 1915 World War I time. And this was at Austro-Hungarian uh, camera. One of the things to note about this was this would actually go um, up in the air with the reconnaissance planes. So they had it set up to, on the next slide you'll see, 
<clears throat> depending on the altitude and the field conditions, this was basically a table to tell them at what, uh, how to focus to get the correct image. So this is the level of technology we were at in World War I in terms of aerial cameras. If they knew what the altitude was, they knew what the site conditions were, this would basically tell them how to focus this off. And you would take it and you actually did have a film. It would generate images on a film here. So the next thing to note, this is basically a World War I uh, field telephone. So this was used, this image on the left is used both as a telephone and telegraph. And it connected, it actually used these two prongs in the front here is how they basically closed the circuit to make it act as a telephone. Um, it connected, uh, it was battery operated and it was all about portability and robustness in the field. So you see they basically had either a wooden uh, container or some type of burlap sack that it would be held in. Um, and one of the other things to note is with respect to signals intelligence, they would actually, um, for counterintelligence, they would put things into the ground that could hear the echoes through the ground level up to three kilometers. So this is World War I time period. Um, if you know uh, Alan Turing, you've, if you've heard of the Enigma machine, this is a, an image of the Enigma machine decoder that Turing basically built to help win the war. One of the things to point out in some of the subsequent images you're going to see is they had larger scale devices like this. So this is, this is the size of probably two of these desks put together. They also had small field portable size ones for people to decode and send messages back and forth. In terms of dates, okay, the first telephone, um, first patent for a field telephone for military purposes was 1885. And a field telephone, as you'll see in these types of slides, it was used by Germany in uh, 1905 was the first time Germany used this type of intelligence uh, for sending codes back and forth. Um, some of these devices also had the ability so that they could send messages via Morse code on them. So there's some really interesting things in here. Uh, this would be one of the smaller Enigma type machines that one of the generals out in the field would use to decode the messages being sent from Germany. So this is, for its time, it, impressively uh, portable in terms of size scales here. In terms of codes and ciphers for these different machines. So this is, if you open it up and look at the different areas, you basically have to limit all, if you're thinking in terms of mathematics, the factorial number of permutations that these codes could be, that it's, it's quite impressive that they're able to basically reverse engineer that to, to read codes. Um, as I said, it was, uh, both uh, US, British, as well as German, Austrian forces, they kind of tried to one-up each other in, in what they were designing here. So some of these devices, you could actually tap into the opponent, as I said, by running uh, wires into the soil. And it was able to listen to energetic pulses, so it could basically, it was a, a low-tech ground penetrating radar at the time to know which direction the codes were being sent and received from. And the, the distance that is quoted that it could reach from soil to tap into the enemy is three kilometers. So that's pretty impressive for 1910, 1920 technology. So a couple other things I wanted to tie in here before we finish. Um, have, have any of you guys been to the Louvre before? 
So one of the things to note, all right, so Leah, Leah, this is the Mona Lisa. You hear about, we talked about scale and perspective. And if you actually see the Mona Lisa at the Louvre, compared to the tapestries and the murals, it's not a very large in scale painting, all right? But it is one of, it's what he's famous for. In addition to that, one of the things to point out is that the Louvre it was basically designed as a military garrison uh, for the French. So I've tagged a few pages here that show there was an initial Louvre and then uh, and that was in the late 1100s to around 1200. Then they have some images here where they, they actually refortified it years later as building materials improved. So in terms of the design by military engineers, uh, essentially 1190 to 1202 was Philip Augustus, and it was built as a castle. Um, and it was on the edge of, edge of the Seine River. And they, the walls in the Louvre were actually, for that castle, were actually higher than the walls for the city into Paris. So they're, they're saying 70 to 80 meters high on each side an approximately square design for the structure. Um, they did have a moat at the base of it, but the moat had no water. What they actually would do is they would use, put their rubbish and garbage in there just to make it a torturous path for anyone who may try to enter, enter into the castle. Uh, so this ties into Da Vinci's time. So 1512 is actually when Da Vinci in his last three or four years of his life, he went. He worked for for one of the leaders of France after France won the war. So around 1512, that that was around the time that there was these innovations in artillery and advancements in fortifications for the structures. So it ties in with a lot of what Da Vinci, as well as some of the other engineers and and Renaissance men of the time, they were designing advances structurally to both the weaponry as well as the, the structures that house the weapons. Um, so in around 1500s, they selected Pierre Lescott as the architect, and then they made some additional changes to the structure that are included in that uh, booklet there. But I wanted to tie it all in because as, as you travel to different areas of the world, you see the influence Da Vinci had not only in Italy but in other countries. So uh, we've tried to tie in something as simple as a catapult to building structures. All right, um, next week, I may, I may use next week to tie into just architecture in general, um, trusses, structures like that, load-bearing structures. Um, and then I may add some uh, case study in terms of wind turbines. But if there's something in particular that you're try interested in, I basically covered the things related to Da Vinci, and next week's talk will be more an architecture of the time type talk. But it will tie into structural materials as well as the, the loading considerations from stress and strain perspective. So that is all I had for today. Um, I'll see you guys next week.